Welcome back to a, uh, another version of Sunday School Monday. Today our lesson will be entitled Compassionate, and it's taken from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. So before we get started, I just want to say something. Um, I know a lot of people are looking at what's going on in America today and some are happy, some are depressed, some are actually scared. And I just want to comment on that in just a minute before I get started. Uh, I don't think this is really about a Democrat versus Republican or conservative versus liberal. I look at this as spiritual warfare. And I've got friends on both sides of the aisle, and uh, I, I lean one way, and you know they lean a different way, but that doesn't mean I don't care for them. But I do believe this is a spiritual battle, and I believe that we all need to look to God for answers, to be able to correct injustices and things that are going on, to bring us together as this great country, because you got to remember, America was built dedicated on Christian values. And that's one of the things that made America so great is because we loved God. God blessed us. And I believe that we are probably the, about the last bastion of Christianity that's available throughout the world. And our mission is to take that gospel message and evangelize the world. Just like the Jews were supposed to do that, they failed miserably. Therefore, you know, the Gentiles got access uh, to the task, and, and I believe it's a large part of that's based upon America. And uh, Satan would love nothing better than to destroy America and silence our voice. So that's why I believe this is more spiritual than anything else. It's an attempt by Satan to destroy America. Uh, you know, we can look at uh, the way things are headed. Uh, a lot of leaders have said, you know, that... Uh, America will be destroyed from within. And buddy, we're fighting right now. It's brutal. I hear tales of family members just not even speaking to each other because one leans one way and one leans the other. But I think the, the big threat is what's going to happen to our freedoms. Uh, we're starting to see uh, censorship. If you're of a conservative persuasion, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, your voice is being stopped. They're using the premise that uh, you were trying to incite violence. Well, you can go back and look at some of the other side and some of the things that were said, especially this past year, and realize that that's not the case. It's not that it's just that you don't agree with the way they agree. And please understand, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I've got a lot of friends that are are very. Um, adamant about the way they feel. Some have actually gotten right ugly about it, saying they hate everybody that's not the way they believe, and they wish they would die. And uh, I, I want you to realize that Satan working through you to make you think such things. But folks, what I want to, you to take away from just this little part right here is that God is still on the throne. God is still in control. God loves you and God wants you. I believe that uh, this could turn into the greatest awakening that the world has ever seen. Um, it could get bad, but I believe it's going to drive people to God because there's nowhere else to go. It could be good what's going to happen. It's still going to drive people to God. Uh, to me, that's the main thing is that people are driven to God and they give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ and are thankful for what he did on Calvary's cross. So take heart, because look up. That's where your salvation is with God. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, again, we thank you for another day you've given us. Lord, we thank you for your peace. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for your mercy. We especially thank you for your salvation. Father, I pray right now that uh, whoever is hearing this, that uh, you would meet whatever need might be in their lives, that 
you would calm their spirit, that you would heal their body, that you would provide for them, that you would bring salvation, whatever the need might be. I pray, Father, that you would meet that need right here, right now. We look to you for all things. We ask that you just give us peace, that you give us that calm assurance that you've got everything under control and that you're working out your plan and that we're just being involved in it. And we thank you for what you're going to do. I pray you will bless the words from this lesson this morning upon the hearts and the ears that hear it. And I give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's take a look at the lesson titled Compassionate. We'll take a, a look at the printed text, and then we'll come back and uh, discuss it, see what God has to say. So beginning with chapter 6 of Luke at verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. All right, now well, let's go back and take a look at the setting. Basically, this uh, scripture is, is kind of identified as the Sermon on the Plain uh, because it took place on a level place, but it goes hand in hand with the Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot of talking in here about Beatitudes and so on and so forth, but it's, uh, it's very important of Jesus to portray what it is that he is bringing. It's turning everything around on its ears because this is not the way people look at things. You got this large crowd out on this level area, this plain. They came from all over. They came from Judea and Jerusalem to the south. They came from uh, Tyre and Sidon, or Sidon, Sidon, however you want to say it, from the north. And they brought people with illnesses and demonic affliction to be healed and delivered. That's another sign of Jesus being who he is because he was able to heal diseases. And this fame is spreading around and a lot of people are, are bringing to him. And this is coming from large areas. And they're on this flat plain so they can see him. So one thing to remember is the highest form of love involves mercy and forgiveness. Now that's something you and I need to take to heart. The highest form of love involves mercy and forgiveness. That's what Jesus did for us. He had mercy on us and he forgave us. It even says in that while uh, Jesus died, he, uh, we hated him, he, he died for us. We, we didn't have to do anything to, to come to, to, you know, for him to, to love us. He loved us 
in spite of ourselves. We just have to recognize that and then ask for forgiveness and come to him. So let's go back here and start in with the uh, printed text and see what God says, starting with verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Wow. All right. Jesus emphasized the difference between non-believers and his followers. So up to this point, he addresses different people. And there's all kinds of people in this crowd. There's followers. There are those there that kind of want to be healed, but they don't really want a relationship with Jesus. There's curious seekers. There's there those for entertainment. There's all kinds of people that are showing up for this. And Jesus says, but to you who are listening. Those are the ones that is addressing, not the ones that came for anything other than that, but the ones that are really listening, that want to hear what Jesus has to say. He's getting ready to give a message. So the contrasting conjunction, but, that starts this verse, distinguishes between the evil people of verses 24 and 26, and you can go back and look at that, and the believers in verses 27 through 31. That's the ones that he's talking to, the ones that want the relationship, that are there to hear what he has to say. All right, so in verse 20, notes that Jesus looks at his disciples, not really the 12 that you think of, but the disciples, the people that are following him and wanting to hear from him. He looks at them, and the passage could be understood as Jesus speaking to his followers in verses 22 through 23, then speaking to the masses in verses 24 <coughs> through 26 and to everyone in verses 27 to 49. But here he addresses them as you who are listening. Those are the ones that he's talking to because they're listening to him. And he says, we can love our enemies because God loved us while we were his enemies. So we can't love our enemies the way that we should unless we have help from God. You can say you can. You can act like it. You can do things. But what does your heart say? There's got to be a change of heart to truly love. And I believe before you can truly and effectually pray for someone, you've got to love them. In other words, if not, that's just words. But if you love them, you're invested in them then you can truly pray for them. All right, love is not merely an emotion. It expresses itself in action. In this case, by doing good to those that hate you. <laughs> That's hard to do, to do good to those that hate you. I'm sure you can think of instances where somebody's done you wrong, and you're saying, Mike, I'm supposed to love that person. That's not what I'm saying. That's what God's saying. Uh, we, we've got to love them. It's, it's, it's not just an emotion. It's an expression. Love is an expression. The verb translates hate. In this verb it says to love your enemies, do good to those that hate you. Well, that verb it translates hate right there contains the sense of ongoing action. They just didn't hate you on one little instance, but it's an ongoing hatred. They despise you. That's what he's telling you to, to do good to. He said, do good to those that hate you. And then he starts building on this, making it even harder and harder to conceive. He said, bless those who curse you. Well, the word bless requires we not only do good, but that we desire God's blessing on that person. So if you bless someone, then you're going to do good to them. But what you're saying is, God, bless them with your riches as well. Okay, so it says to bless those who curse you. Well, the curse here means much more than using foul language. It connotes a malevolent desire for continual harm. So when they curse you, basically what they are doing, they are in an ongoing process of hoping for harm to come to you 
continually. So basically, uh, bless is a compound term meaning to speak well of someone. Curse is they want continual harm to come upon you. And yet here, Jesus says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Now, there's no way in the world you can do that unless you have God helping you. It's got to come. An even deeper level of love requires that we pray for those who mistreat us. These people not only hate and curse us, but they are actively doing harm to us. The only way you can love somebody like that is through God. And that's who he's talking to. So he's throwing these ideas out to get people to start thinking, who is God? What does God want of me? What am I supposed to be doing? Same thing for you and I. Verses 29 and 30. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, then also offer to them your shirt. Or don't withhold that. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Well, doggone, that's just not the way we look at things. But this is what God is saying. Verse 29 should not be mistaken as saying someone suffering abuse should endure it. That's not what we're saying. If somebody's in an abusive relationship, get out. That's not what this is applying to. Okay? So uh, if somebody comes up and slaps you on the cheek and then you turn the other cheek, we've got to look at that in the context of what's going on here. If uh, it's something that can say, I'm not going to get in the gutter of this fight with you. Now, you've got to defend yourself. You're not just going to be a, a whipping post and let somebody just come in and just beat the snot out of you. But it's basically if somebody just gets mad and smacks you and say, okay, take this one too if you want. Trying to prove a point. Then there comes a point where you have to say, hey, you're not going to hit me anymore. But that's not the concept here. It's somebody striking you out of anger over something you said to them or because of something the way you act, being godly. Because that can stir up emotions in an evil person that we can't explain. So it's basically we're showing that we are above this. We're showing the love of God. And that smack of the cheek could be a bad word or something he said to you as well. So let's look at different areas how this could work. But then it goes down and says, if somebody takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt. Well, the coat is this outer garment that Jewish men would wear back in this day and time. And this shirt, they call it, is the tunic that's underneath the coat. So if somebody takes your coat either by theft or by force, well, then don't withhold your shirt. If they want to take that too, let them have it. Basically, what it's saying is you're showing you're a much different person. And that can cause somebody to say, hey, you're weird, and uh, strike up a conversation. We don't want to get revenge. Somebody might have a need for something like that, and they take it by force. Uh, it could be they're just pure team mean. But whatever the reason is, we want to set a higher example or a higher standard in the way that we operate, showing that we belong to God. So if basically we look at all our possessions as belonging to God and somebody takes something from you, they basically, basically take it from God. It's up to God to handle that. Okay. Then he goes on down and he said, Give to everyone who asked you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Have you ever had a neighbor has to borrow something from you. You let them have it and then they never bring it back. Where's my stuff? Just let it go. Gift it to them. You're trying to show you're a different caliber of person. And sometimes people can say, what's wrong with you? Why do you act that way? Why are you always smiling? Why do you never get mad? It gives you a great opportunity to share the love of Christ, to witness to that person. Isn't that what it's all about anyway? You know, God can give you back what you've lost or whatever. Getting into a fight doesn't do anything, doesn't prove anything, just maybe who's stronger. Uh, we want to try to set an example. 
And I think that's the idea that Jesus is trying to portray here. It's not that we become whipping posts or anybody can take advantage of us and just do what they want to to us. But it's the idea of us trying to live above a certain standard, not to say that we're looking down on everybody, but that we are here to try to help to win people to Christ. If we love people more than possessions, then we can give the item to the individual in Christ's name so that we might bear witness of his love. It's a good way to look at things. I've known people like that, and I admire them. You know, I used to think, wow, what a weak person. But I get it. I'm getting it more and more. The older I get, the more I get things, and I see what God's trying to say. Now, verse 31 is a very familiar verse. You've heard it said in different ways, and we've actually got a term for it. It's called, do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, what do we know that as? The golden rule. So this is Jesus saying, do to other people what you would like them to do to you. In other words, treat everybody the way you want them to treat you. No matter how they're treating you right now, treat them the way you want to be treated. It says that uh, Jesus urged his followers, the ones with ears, the ones that are listening, to consider what would you have others do to you? And if we think like that, then we can put that into practice and say, I'm going to treat you the way I want to be treated. Hopefully, people will start to come around and get that idea. Uh, we simply treat others the way we wish to be treated. Now, Believers are to treat all people, all people, with dignity and respect. Don't just treat the ones that you've classified as my people, but do it to everybody. Those that are below you, those that are above you, those that are beside you, whatever status in life they happen to be, you treat them all with respect. That also goes for the unborn. We need to treat them with respect. I believe that's one of the things that God's judging this nation on is for all the babies we've murdered since abortion became legal back in 72, 73. Sixty-some million babies have been slaughtered. God can't turn a blind eye to that. Folks, that's one of the things that really scares me about one of the parties that promotes that in their platform is... Uh, the right to choose. No, the right to choose occurred when you made that baby. Babies are precious. That's a human soul. Be careful. But believers are to treat all people with dignity and respect. All right, verses 32 through 36. This is a, a, an interesting scenario here of certain things that compare what we should do and what we shouldn't do in the way that we act and, and given implications that sinners do the same thing, it's the attitudes, okay, and how we look at things. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, then what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. It's basically a carryover from verses 29 and 30. The same thing. But here <coughs> the point is what these words mean. Jesus pointed out three examples in which Christian love should exceed the natural human response. There's the key. Our natural response is to do certain things, but our Christian love should motivate us to elevate that and go higher. Love those who love them. Even sinners love those who love them. In other words, nothing about this kind of behavior brings glory to God. It's nothing special. That's just expected. That's common human nature. Everybody's going to love people that love them. That's nothing good. The word credit here, the term credit, is the same word normally rendered as grace. So, loving the people who love us does not reveal the grace of God or any real kindness on a human level. It is merely the expected reaction. 
So if we go above that, and we're going to see that down here in a minute, what he's saying, that's what's bringing glory to God. That's when grace starts to abound. All right. In the second part, if we do good to people who are good to us, we are not doing anything extraordinary either. Sinners do the same thing. And then the third example is if we lend to those from whom we expect repayment in return, we merely mirror decent society. It's just the expected thing. It's just the norm. But then in verse 35, it says, But love your enemies. Do good to them that lend and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Wow. So if somebody needs some money, you lend it to them, expecting I'm never going to see it again, and I'm okay with that. That's the attitude it should be. You have, they don't. They're asking for help. Give it to them. Don't expect it back. If they give it back, fine. If they don't, that's fine. All right. It said, then your reward will be great. Hmm. And you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. All right, if we lend to those from whom we expect repayment, nothing. If we love those that we, uh, because they love us, nothing. If we're kind to those who are kind, not, nothing, okay? But in verse 35, Jesus again uses that contrasting conjunction, but to emphasize the difference between these examples and what he wants believers to do. All right, so we just looked at that. And now he comes down here and he says that to, to love our enemies. Do good to them. It says, similarly, our willingness to lend should not be limited to people who can pay us back. So all of these things go above and beyond that. Believers who embrace Jesus' ethic of love and apply it to all people, will experience two benefits. First, they will receive a reward that will be great. Second, is being identified as children of the Most High. He labels us as followers of God. But we're not just that label, we truly are children of God. Because we can't do these things unless God indwells us through the Holy Spirit. We don't have that power within us because of the sin nature. So when God comes to save us, it takes up residence in our hearts, he changes our attitudes. He gives us the grace to do what's right. He gives us the power to do what's right, making us seem or be recognized as children of God. God's grace is not dependent on the gratitude of the receiver of that grace. Let me read that again. God's grace is not dependent on the gratitude of the receiver of that grace. Wow. God bestows mercy to all who repent and receive him. If we would be known as children of the Most High, we should demonstrate love toward all people equally. Wow. God's full of grace. We're not. But we can learn to be full of grace because of God. And that's what we need to do, is extend our grace to others based on the grace that we received from God. Okay, Jesus commanded his followers to be merciful. We may have it in our power to exact retribution on people who harm us, but instead we are to be forgiving. Wow, that's a hard pill to swallow unless you have the Holy Spirit to help you do that. What is our motivation? Our Father is merciful. If we are God's children, we will demonstrate mercy towards others as he has extended mercy to us. Okay? We need to do that. We need to show who we are. That's how we gather more mercy from him, by showing more mercy to others. Don't withhold that mercy for people that show you mercy. That's exactly what he's saying don't do. Go above and beyond. Step out in faith 
that God's going to take care of you. Be a difference in this world. Do something extraordinary. All right, verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. All right, let me put a little disclaimer, disclaimer here. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. We're not talking about God saying, well, if you don't judge anybody else, then I'm not going to judge you and you're safe and sound whether you get saved or not. That, that's not what this is saying, okay? This is talking about how we live. Once you get saved, does that mean you stop sinning? I wish. It doesn't. We're still sinners. That's why 1 John 1, 9 was put in the Bible. It said if we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, he's faithful and just to forgive us because he knows we're still going to sin. We're still in this sin nature as part of us. And it's constantly warring with the God's nature that's indwelling us through the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we get weak and, and we falter and we sin. Okay, but here's the thing. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. All right, this word judge comes from a root word meaning to consider someone guilty. So if we're judging, we're imposing a sentence in our mind because we're looking at that person as being guilty. You don't know the motivation from that person. You don't know the situation or the circumstance. A funny little story, maybe some of you have heard this, but Mr. Jones was driving home from work one evening and his car ran out of gas in front of Mrs. Smith's house. Well, the uh, town uh, started, you know, spreading gossip that he spent the night there. Because his car was there, broke down. People are looking for ways to slander people. They find joy in that because it justifies their own problems. So what we got to do is we got to be very, very careful about looking at something and judging it. That's what God's saying. Don't judge that. You don't know what's going on. Don't assess guilt right there. And if you don't, then people are not going to do that to you. God's not going to look at you as being guilty because of what you just did right there. All right? So do not condemn, which has a similar concept as do not judge. The warning not to judge does not mean to avoid discernment, but rather not to set ourselves up as a judge and jury because only God is the true judge. So don't look at a situation and automatically come to a decision that you think is going on. You can be discernment. You can use discernment, but God's the judge. It says, for you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. We should forgive as God has forgiven us. So be careful, because that judging spirit also can lead to a gossiping spirit. That's the story I was going with Mr. Jones, that they would use that to start the gossip train going. Stop it. Stop it right now. That's judging. Don't do that. And then the last verse, 38. Give, and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Instead of criticizing, judging, and condemning people, the children of a merciful Heavenly Father focus on how they can benefit others. Okay? We do not give with the motivation of seeking a return on our investment. God is not miserly with his gifts. It says that if we give and, you know, give to others, it's going to be given back to us. So it talks about a good measure. Now, we can get into a lot of different things about how things were measured with scales and balances and how they would cheat and everything else. But here it's talking about God's measure. He said it's a good measure because if we take like a, a basket of grain, you pour some in there and say, okay, it's close enough. 
But out here, it's, <clears throat> it's a good measure that's pressed down, shaken together so all the little loose air pockets are filled with more grain, and you keep adding to it till it's running over. This is the way God gives to us. It's a basket full of grain that's been pressed down, sifted and shaken around so all the air pockets are filled up with grain, which allows more space for more grain to come in, and it's actually running over with grain. And it's poured into your lap so it's not spilled out. You've still got it. It's a personal thing. God poured it on you in your lap so that you have it. That's God's measure. You can't outgive God. So given it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What's your motivation? What's your attitude when giving to someone? Do you give with the idea of saying, we better give that back? Or do you give with the idea that brother or that sister needs that? I'm going to provide, and I'm even going to go above and beyond what they're asking for because they might need a little bit more. That's the way God would do it. And when you do that, God's going to do that right back to you even more. God loves you. And I do too. I pray you have a great week. And we'll see you next week. Let's close in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for the lesson. We thank you for caring enough about us to provide your word through preaching and teaching. We also know, Lord, that you love us and that you're going to take care of us. Soothe our hearts. Soothe our fear. Soothe everything that's troubling us right now. And let us just experience your love and how much we've got to look forward to with you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name and amen. I'll see you next week.